Thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds, for you have upheld my right and my cause, sitting enthroned as the righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their names forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken my enemies. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equality. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. If you'd like to listen to our prelude as we light our candles. <laughs>
for your response to reading. We walk in darkness. We live in the land of deep darkness. We have seen a great light. Light shines upon us. God brings us joy. We rejoice before our God. If you'd like to stand if you're able to sing our opening song, come Christians join to sing on page nine. and every one of us so that the world may see your light and we all may say alleluia amen when we pray this in the name of jesus who taught us to pray our father, father amen. who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. share with you um part of our trip that we were on last week when we were in texas uh we, we had the privilege of going to church with with sue's mom um at the park there and it was uh it was a spanish service um thank thankfully it was bilingual so i didn't and i didn't have to figure out although they did sing one 
song in Spanish and I just sat there and moved my lips the whole time. So I was hoping nobody would come up and try to speak to me in Spanish afterwards. I would have been really embarrassed. But we had a good time. Um, and he got to listen about it's all about Jesus. Yes. Yes. But anyway, he was sharing he was sharing the passage that he was sharing is that passage from Luke with about Martha and Mary coming um, and Jesus was was in their presence and, and Mary was sitting at, at the feet of, of Jesus and, and Martha was doing all the preparation and at the very end Jesus Martha said you know hey make Mary do some of the work here <laughs> and, and, and Jesus said well no oh, she's got a better thing she needs to be in the presence and he said this from, from Psalms 27, which, which I was already there in my Bible, but then he brought it up, which was pretty cool. Um, Psalms 27, verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. I just think that's a that's a beautiful, beautiful passage in in, in Psalms, and, and it, it kind of when he was sitting there talking, and then I had a Bible that I'd borrowed from Nona, and I'd already flipped to Psalms twenty seven, and he went there, and it was like ah, the Spirit's talking to me. But when we come into our prayer, that that should be our prayer each and every day every moment that we, we pray is just to be able to gaze upon the glory of the Lord and inquire in his temple. His temple is, is not limited to the sanctuary, but his temple is the earth, the world. The temple is you. And you are the very temple, the very embodiment of the Spirit of God. Let us come into our time of, of prayer by singing our prayer in the child. 133. Mm -hmm. Hear these our prayers, O oh Lord. Gracious God, we lift up to you this morning our prayers, both spoken and unspoken. 
both of joy and of sorrow. Like a child, we do come to you this morning and ask that you would be present with us through the power of your Holy Spirit. That you would receive us as a child, that you would teach us your ways. Gracious God, we thank you. Thank you for the grace that you have shown us through your Son, Jesus Christ. A grace that we aren't deserving of, but a grace that we have received when we, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Gracious God, give us the strength, give us the courage to go out into this world that we, even though we've received you like a child, may have the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim that a child has come to save us. And that that child grew into a man and he went to the cross and for the whole world the whole world grace and salvation is there for the asking gracious god this morning we lift up to you those that we have been praying for we lift up to you those that are hurting physically emotionally spiritually we ask that they would be found through the power of your holy spirit that they would be healed they would be made whole through that power and father even though we are slow on the giving thanks part we do give you thanks thanks for the love and the hope and the faith that you have instilled in each and every one of us. The spiritual gifts that you have given us. May we go in peace. Show the world your peace and your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 I appeal to you brothers and sisters by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you that but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you my brothers and sisters what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to be send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will not. I love that passage. I have to, well, there's a lot of them I love that I'm going to get into today, so maybe I should not repeat that all the time. That is one of my all time favorites.
we come to the table each and every week to, to, to witness the power of the cross and, and, and the life and the salvation that is found in that cross. It, it is an instrument of death, and yet for us it's an inner instrument of life everlasting. Christians today seem to be caught up in the peripheral, peripheral of Christianity. And then somehow we're losing, I feel, the power of that cross. Somehow the cross is being lost in the message of Christianity today. Somehow we got to get it back. And it starts, I believe, right here at this table. When we participate together, we can, we can argue about all the things on the outside. But when we get together at this table, we are witnesses and we are examples of the power of the cross. For it is in the broken bread that we see Christ's broken body. It is in the spilled blood that we have been washed of our sins. This is the power of the cross that should be uniting each and every one of us. We shouldn't let the other stuff divide us to the point that we cannot partake in this table together. One of the beautiful things that I love about the Disciples of Christ Christian Church is that we are called as one. We don't have to be disciples of Christ. We don't have to, to go through some certain creed. We don't have to say certain words. We are all invited to this table. We are all asked to participate as one with him. For the invitation is not mine. The invitation is not the elders. The invitation comes directly from Jesus Christ. And in that cross, we must, we must stand or we're going to lose everything. Let us come to a time of communion. One bread, one body. Number three, nine, nine.
Please be seated. Jesus reminds us of his promise. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Through sharing of the bread and wine and thankful remembrance, we experience the assurance of God's great love and kindness in Jesus. Sustained and nourished within the body of Christ by these emblems, we entrust ourselves to God's future filled with hope and promise. So we recall that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and after he broke it, he said, this is my body, take eat of this. And likewise, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Be in the spirit of prayer. Jesus, your words, your promise, not only spoken, but shown to us. This is what gets us through our days. You are what gets us through our days, today and always. We throw ourselves at your feet to walk with you, to follow you. And when we can no longer take those steps on our own, we give ourselves completely to you. And with our complete faith in you, we pray in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's all break bread together. And drink from the cup together. we do praise you with these our talents may they be of monetary value or just of ourselves we ask that you would take them and receive them in a way that would further your kingdom here on earth and we pray this in jesus name amen amen, amen. on the back of your bulletin uh, comes to us from Matthew chapter 4 and, and it's one that I'm sure is familiar to all of you um, the Old Testament reading for today came from, to us from Isaiah chapter 9 and 9 verses 1 through 4 and what I would like to do um, is have a little Bible study with you all um, so I'm going to go back to Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to add some verses to, to, uh, to what the lectionary had. and Because and, I think it's important for us to have this understanding of, of, of the Old Testament reading before we jump in to the New Testament reading today. So, um, and, and hopefully this will make sense to somebody other than me. Um, I'm, I'm done, so. so if you want to follow along, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, but actually I'm going to add a verse from chapter 8. Uh, it's going to be chapter 8, starting in verse 22. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness and gloom and anguish 
the name will be thrust into thick darkness. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. And in the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as they, as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Then I'm going to skip down to verse 6. For to us a child was born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over the kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And may God bless the reading of his word. That last part of that passage, that whole chapter probably is familiar to, to most of us, but that last part of that passage should be especially familiar to us when we come into the Advent season. For it's seemingly every year at Advent and every year around Christmas, that is part of the lectionary series. So that should be very familiar to all of us. But we should understand where Isaiah is coming from in this particular passage. <laughs> the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judea had, had split apart. They were no longer one. And now the Assyrians, who were the big dogs in, in, in the whole world, were coming and conquering all the lands. And they were soon to come to the northern kingdom of Israel. And Israel king, Israel's king Ahaz, whose wife was Jezebel, was asking the southern kingdom of Judea to come and help him. He had already signed a pact with another country, Syria, and, and kind of, even though they did this against the will of God the Father, and Ahaz, the one thing he did was said no. And Isaiah was prophesying at this time that yes, the northern kingdom was going to fall. The northern kingdom was going to fall. But there was going to be dark, in the darkness there was going to be light. For there will be a child that was going to be born that was going to bring great light and reunite the land of the nations. And what we're going to read in the New Testament is the land of the Gentiles. Naphtali, and I hope I'm saying that, Nap Naphtali, that's how you're supposed to say it. Naphtali and Zebulun were both sons of Jacob. And that tribe, those tribes, were guaranteed an inheritance in the promised land. This promised land is where that Sea of Galilee is, and in that province of Galilee, next to the Sea of Galilee. And that's where we get that name Galilee, and the Galilee of nations was going to be when the Assyrians take over that area, that northern kingdom. The king... Isaiah was looking at and what the Jews would say was King Hezekiah that he was gonna that was a um, that was the son of Ahaz he was gonna reunite all 
of Israel and as that light was going to be a light for the nations. That's what brings us to Matthew. If you want to follow along, that's on the back of your bulletin. Matthew chapter 4. And this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Starting in verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory, territory known as Zebulun and Naphtali. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the sound that land in Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen great things. And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the sea, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishermen of sea of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And among and going on from there he saw two brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with their with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogue and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And may God bless the reading of the word. We pray. Gracious God, I do pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart would be true to you, my Lord, my Savior. Amen. This passage comes up of every three years. And every three years, or whenever I have the opportunity to preach from them, I always go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 because I don't want to preach from this passage. Because it seemingly comes right after John's gospel, where John talks about the calling of the disciples. And, and if you look at it, there, there's some conflict in the two callings of the disciples and so I, I kind of skipped by it but this year I, I'm not going to focus so much on the calling of the disciples but I want to focus on the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ according to Matthew because right this follows right after Jesus being tempted in the desert being tempted three times by the devil. The devil asked him, or told him, he could have the entire kingdom if he would just bow down and worship him. We all know the story. We've all heard that story. Soon after this particular passage, we get into the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably the greatest sermon ever given. That beats mine all the head. That's <coughs> Kyle's and, and Ryan's probably are on par with it, but not me. But, but this is the beginning of his ministry. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is the same message that John the Baptist was giving when he was baptizing those in the Jordan River. Repent. Repent. Have a change of mind. Have a change of heart. For Christ, for God, is going to do great things. Repent. Now, repent doesn't mean that we're sorry for something. And repent means that we change our ways. That we have a different way of looking at things. That, that we have a change of heart. That we can see God working differently in the world than what we perceive God to work in the world. John was arrested. John was in prison. Knowing the end of the story, we know that John is beheaded. 
Jesus sees this and he retreats into the desert. We, we see Jesus retreating into Egypt with, with, with Mary and Joseph. We here we see Jesus retreating into the desert. But not to run away from conflict, but to begin his ministry. Three years of ministry to change the world. He goes into this territory of Galilee, and I'm going to butcher this name again, Naphtali and Zebulun. The, the one thing you got to understand about the Jesus of, of Matthew is that Jesus is the fulfillment of all prophecy according to Matthew. If you go throughout Matthew's gospel, he talks about this is to fulfill prophecy. This is to fulfill prophecy. John's gospel is a gospel of grace, but this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament. That's why I think we need to have a basis in the Old Testament in order to understand what Jesus was being called to do here and now. To proclaim the kingdom of heaven. I find it interesting in the Old Testament Isaiah talks about the kingdom of God but in the New Testament Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. He is now calling that the light is the light the, the Galatians is going to be the Galatians of the Gentiles and that is all the world not just the Jews but the, all the nations all the Gentiles and Jesus is calling calling to ministry those who would follow him. He goes and preaches along the shoreline. Now we can debate and discuss and we have many a time why those first disciples, John and James, Peter and, and, and Andrew would, would, would actually lay down their nets and follow him immediately. We can argue to the, to the wit's end about that. Because according to Old Testament, according to the Ten Commandments, this is a breaking of the commandments. Honor thy mother and father is number five. And to leave their father stranded in the work boat, in the fish boat, would be a breaking of that commandment. And yet, I wonder if their fathers weren't in on, on that. It says in, in the gospel here that, that Jesus was preaching. I believe in my heart of hearts that, that those first disciples would have heard Jesus preaching. That they would have heard their calling. And when he asked them to join him as disciples, that is why they left so quickly. But I think they did it, I would like to think they did it, with the blessing of their fathers. Of course, Jesus, being the eldest son, he shouldn't have been out being an itinerant preacher either. He should have been home with Mary because we know by this time that Joseph was gone and Mary's responsibility was Jesus. Or Jesus' responsibility was Mary. my story. <laughs> the disciples at this time, I don't believe they knew what the kingdom of heaven was about. They needed to be taught those three years. They needed to be hear the stories of Jesus. They needed to hear his teaching. They needed to witness his healing of the lame in order to fully fulfill to, to fully understand what 
the kingdom of heaven was all about. It wasn't one where violence was going to overthrow the ruling authorities. But it was one of peace. One of love. One of understanding. And prayerfully, hopefully, one of unity. It was one where there's going to be sacrifice <coughs> for the all. And that sacrifice was going to come through Jesus himself. Hear the calling. Hear the word. Jesus is calling all of us to be disciples. The kingdom of heaven is upon us. Repent. Repent and be one with him. Be one with each other. So that the power of the cross is not lost, that the power of the cross may grow. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus who went on that cross for us. We ask that you would be with us this week. Give us the power and the strength carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ and his disciples. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We call ourselves disciples.
words of that hymn, and that would have <laughs> that would have summed up my sermon. Now I'm just right through. Them. Anyway, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love that comes from God the Father and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>